Yeah, this is an interesting thing you're doing, I think. And um, where I am now is very different than where I was, say, 10 years ago. And it's difficult to kind of go back and recount a lot of the things when you've got a different course of your life. So you're going this way, and this is here, right? So this kind of worried me for a bit when I was thinking about you coming. But then I went to a movie last Saturday and uh, took Liam with me. And um, it was uh, Arrival. I don't know if you've seen it yet. It's, um, it's a story of uh, a spacecraft who come and and um, land on Earth in a number of different spots, right? And um, the main um, character in the story is a linguist. And the whole theme of the story is translation, how to translate these people into us, right? And it's a film by Denis Villeneuve. And uh, it's got great reviews. So I took Liam to see it. And uh, it raised a whole bunch of issues that took me back in to my Aboriginal way of thinking, which I haven't done in years. And it has to do with the obliteration of time. And it got me thinking about this and how to approach it. And a whole question of memory and recollecting things that happened now 50 years ago accurately and certain aspects of the film certain themes in the film like stand out one was translation being a big issue another at the beginning of the film was um, the, the line in the film that says there can be a day in your life one day that changes the entire future course of your life and that brought me back to the death of my son. It changed everything. And, and then there was aspects of uh, misunderstanding and the consequences of misunderstanding another culture in the sense that these aliens would come in and things like that. So a whole lot of things <clears throat> started to go through my mind. And then I was thinking about this whole idea of the obliteration of time because in the film it's not clear when you're in the present or the future. The, the linguist is uh, having visions, but you're not sure if they're visions of the future or she's remembering the past. It's not really about time travel. It's about more about the visions. So she has a vision of losing a child. And you think in the film that it happened already. Turned out it hadn't happened yet. It's in the future. So I got to thinking about my experiences with the Aborigines, and one person in particular, a guy called Naugula Ben Alalara, which, who was my elder brother in, in the culture. And he died in the early, early 2000s. And I was thinking, what does this mean, the obliteration of time? What did it mean to the Aboriginal people? And how, did it, how does it work, right? Well, if you think, yourself right now and you think about back when you came in the door you can interpret that as you came in the door you you talked you sat down and you began to interview what you've done then is you've imposed time on what is actually a continual present so that all we really experience in life is a continual present right through from beginning to end and if you think in your mind your consciousness is that continual present. It's always the same. And it's right, it's a constant. So in a sense, there's no past, there's no future. There's just this continual present that keeps going. Well, in the Aboriginal world, 
that continual present just keeps going after you die. It doesn't disappear. So the continual present just goes into another dimension. It doesn't stop. Your body stops. Everything around you, these things here disintegrate. Eventually they wear out. But this continuing present keeps going into another dimension and you're there, but you're in a different form. And then I think, well, okay, if, if that's the case, say they're, they're, this is true, right? Can you access that continuing present that you've already experienced again? And can you access this continuing present, which is to come? Because if it's a continuing present, there is no future of it and there's no past of it. It's just continuing now, right? And that brought me to Gula. And it got, brought me to how am I going to remember accurately things that happened in my life 50 years ago, 70 years ago. I can remember bits and pieces, but do I really remember accurately what happened? What, even what I wrote? Do I even understand what I wrote 25 years ago myself? I don't know. Gula was different. Gula, in the mid-90s, I had 660 songs I'd, tra I'd recorded between 1969 and 1974 for mortuary ceremonies. I recorded all these songs. I translated some from my first book, Tradition and Transformation, but not them all, obviously. It would take forever. So I thought what I'd do is I'd take ex excerpts from the songs, maybe 30 second excerpts, put them on a tape, and then take the tape back to Gula and see if you could identify what songs they were and what clan they belonged to. All right, that's my project. So I got a grant and I went over a couple of times to do that. I was thinking, okay, you just sit down with the guy and you play it. And he says, yeah, that's the Stingray song and uh, blah, 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 and you record it and off you go. That's not what happened. What happened was I would go over to his camp, a place called, it's on Bickerton Island, which is adjacent to Groot Island in the Northern Territory. And Groot Island is a very big island and Bickerton's a small island beside it. And he camps out there, he camped out there to be away from the troubles on the big island because there was mining going on there was drinking and social problems, right? So what would happen is the sun would rise in the morning. He'd come out of his hut and sit there for maybe half an hour, just sit there. And he had instructions that no one was to come around when we were doing what we're doing, right? So he would come over, sit down, wouldn't say a word, and he'd just say, turn on the tape. So I'd turn on the, the tape recorder and he'd listen. He was not there. He was in the present moment of 1995, 19, no, sorry, 1969 to 74. He was in the moment of that song being sung. He could see it and he could describe not just what the song was, but he could describe not only who was singing it, who was playing the didgeridoo, where I was sitting in the group recording it and who else was sitting there, what they were doing. 660 songs he did this for. He was there. It wasn't our kind of memory. It was a different kind of memory. It was a memory that could place him in the present back that far ago. That's what he was doing. And then he would kind of come out of it and then just go and do his normal stuff. And we'd do this every day for weeks, right, to get it all done. It was almost like a, a meditation, like a Zen monk, you know, sitting, getting the real world out of his mind and then focusing on to that moment that he was in that many years ago. I thought that was amazing that he could do that. So the film brought that to mind, that there's a, a constant present that we interpret or we impose a concept of time on and compartmentalize it and, and cause effect, all this kind of thing. But the reality of 
the deep reality of our existence is that we live in the, the present all the time and nothing else. That's what we do. And you can feel it if you reflect inside yourself and think about it. That's what you're doing. You're living always now. It's always now. So for me to go back and review publications that I wrote way back 50 years ago, some of them, uh, I can't do that. I can't go back because the only way you could be accurate would be in the moment where you actually created and wrote it. That's the only way you could be accurate. Otherwise, you're interpreting your own work or reinterpreting your own work. So I decided I'm not going to read any of it except the one you gave me on um, the history of Canadian ethnology to re that I wrote for the Royal Anthropological Institute, which I didn't even remember I'd written. I had to go and get it out of the library and read it in order to, to realize that I'd, I'd written the thing. And it was interesting to read. But I honestly don't remember really writing it, and it, you know, I couldn't tell you the day or whatever. But it was interesting to read, and the funny thing about the article was most of it's come true, the predictions. So is that the same kind of thing that Villeneuve was talking about in this film? Not going into the future, but having a vision of where it's going to go and being accurate about it. I don't know. So just the movie, the film, it raised these very fundamental issues for me, which related back to my Aboriginal experience. So if you say to me, well, you know, where did it all begin where you're born? And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, hmm, when did we come to Canada from England? And for a few years, I thought, well, it was either 1947, maybe 1948, 1949, right? And I couldn't really remember. I just remember going on a boat, and we come on a boat, and did we, where did we land? Was it Montreal, or did we land in Halifax? I didn't really know. Then my daughter, for my 70th birthday, came across, got a man manifest from that voyage, and it was in 1948, in May, and there's our names, my mom, my dad, my three brothers, the three of us, I should say. But it didn't say where we landed. It was, the ship goes from Halifax to Montreal and that circuits and goes back again. There was the Aquitania, which was a wartime transport vessel, a big liner, right, P&O liner. So I think, well, can you really trust your memory then about these things, right? Even if you go back and read what you wrote, can you be sure that's what it meant when you wrote it? Because you're constantly going to reinterpret. The only way to do it is to try and get back into the space when you wrote it. And that's, that's where it kind of is right now. So it's a tricky business, trying to remember this kind of past occurrences. If you can't do what Gula does, he can actually be there when it happened, literally be in that present. So that the film is about the, the collapsing of time. No more time. And then what's the world like if you collapse time and don't recognize time as an entity, as an imposition on reality? Zen monks do the same thing. Obliterate the world of illusion around you through meditation, and you penetrate through it and see something different, right? So that's where it's at. Does that make any sense? Yeah, we all. It makes sense. <laughs> but it's a brilliant film. It's just a brilliant film. You have to see it. So just a very brilliant, just a, a different take. It's, it's based on a book. Uh, I think it's called um, "This Is Your Life" or "This Is it's About a Life, a Life Story." The ending's different than the book. And the ending of the movie, the aliens give the uh, Earth people their language, and their language is not a verbal language, it's a visual language. It's kind of smoke, uh, they, they emit smoke, or a kind of a plasma, and it goes in kind of a circle, half circle, and it's got codes in it. That's what they give the earthlings, their language. In the movie, they give them the plans to a spaceship to go at interstellar travel, right? But it's, the fact of the, of the movie is that they're not using verbal communication like we do. 
In other words, verbal communication be, may be as much of a prison as it is a liberating thing to have. Gula always told me that he opposed the kids, the Aboriginal kids, learning reading and writing. And I asked him why. Why would you want, want your kids to learn reading and writing? He said, they destroy the memory. And I said, how do you know that? And he just looked at me and he just sort of said, well, you come here every year or two. We teach you all this stuff. You go away, you write it all down, you go away and you come back and you've forgotten half of it. I'm like, holy jumpins, there's a slap in the face. And then that's what we do. We're so busy taking notes because we know we gotta leave that we can study them after if we write them down that we forget that we have to really understand it when we're learning it. And that's, I think a lot of anthropologists, we make that mistake. We're so busy taking notes that we forget to learn how to do things in the culture. And that's what Gula's is talking about. He's talking about, he called it seeing with the mind. You have like a, a, a visual acuity in your mind that can see the world as, as it truly is, as opposed to interpreting it through, you know, texts and books and theories and things like that. And the other interesting thing about it was there's a, there was an old man there named Galeawa, who I got really close to. He didn't speak any English in 1969. Didn't speak any English at all, not a word. So I couldn't really communicate with him till I'd learned the language, and that took a long time, six, eight months, a very difficult language. But when I did get enough fluency in the language to communicate with this old guy, I mean, he was in his 80s, and he was born in the bush and didn't know anything much about white people at all. I would sit there complaining to him about the missionaries coming and trying to convert them to Christianity, about the mining coming, about the young people kind of losing their way, and he would just laugh. He would laugh and chuckle. He had this amazing chuckle, like deep down, and you know, chuckle. And I was like, and he'd just say, it doesn't matter. I already know basically what's going to happen. It, it doesn't really, it's just going to happen this way. And you don't, it's not about our culture. It's about someone like you comes along and you learn things and you can also apply these same things where you're going. It's not our culture is located here and we practice it here and that's got boundaries. We teach you some stuff and you go away with that stuff and you apply it where you're going, right? That was his attitude. So was he seeing the future or was he just... I don't know. Well, he was being nice, right? He was being complimentary that you can learn what we know and we can teach you and you can go away and do it. Well, you try and practice here what they practice there. It's really very, very difficult. The whole, the whole way of life is predicated on different premises than ours and it took me 20 years before I figured it out, 20 years. So the first works that I did were by most standards pretty good especially the first one, Traditional Transformation, the one you mentioned. But they weren't really what it was all about. And that didn't come until 1980, around 1988, I guess, around the 86 to 88, when I went back again. I went back a number of times, but this one was special. And um, essentially I learned that I'd been studying backward, upside down. I was studying from the ground up, where their culture was constructed from the heavens down. It, was, it wasn't um, a political superstructure that was determining you know, social organization, social structure, behavior. It was a spiritual one. But I didn't know that until I had accessed that spiritual side myself. It's not an idea. You have to see it. And until you've seen it, it doesn't make any sense. And that happened in a period of grief and pain when there was nothing else going on in my mind except that. And my mind opened up to stuff they've been trying to teach me that I'd never even imagined before. I could see things that they could see. I could see the illumination around things. I could see uh, the images of uh, spirits in the fire with, during mortuary ceremony. I could see them, visually see them. It wasn't because I had a special gift or ability. 
it was because I was so distracted by suffering and pain that my senses, other senses opened right up. They weren't interfered with by interpretation. I wasn't interpreting what I saw. I just saw it. And then I went to a Zen monastery in Japan for a little while with a student of mine, Yuji Ueno, who's Japanese and lives over there. I started, you know, going through different experiences in different religions of the same kind. And if and then I wrote a, 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 the book, The Spirit Lives, is that's what it's about. The Spirit Lives is about coping with death and discovering a, a kind of commonality between the world religions that isn't often talked about, a, a, a spiritual aspect, not an intellectual aspect, not a dogmatic aspect. So that's where that came from. And then after that, I lost touch with anthropological discourse, you see, because nobody wanted to talk about stuff like that. They just wanted to talk about ideas and theories and blah, blah, blah. They didn't want to talk about lived experience and what that meant to the people that I work with. And once they're not interested in the people I work with, I'm not interested in them at all. So that was it. Forget it. See you later. So I started to kind of extract myself from the discipline. I went into the Center for Religious Studies in Toronto, out of the anthropology, halfway out of the anthropology department. Uh, stayed out of the politics, just, you know, didn't really get involved in that anymore. The organization of departments and things like that. And I just taught, taught my, my classes. And I taught differently. I didn't teach the same way as before. I didn't teach abstractly. I didn't teach. I taught experientially. I taught my students how to experience things directly rather than analyze them and theoretically, you know, understand them. And the classes were really, really popular, really popular. And uh, but that wasn't in the discipline anymore. I was outside, outside the walls of anthropological discourse, right? But I didn't care. I had tenure. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a part of it, eh? Like that's what we're there for. You're given this protection so that you can explore different things that other people might not find acceptable. And having the freedom to do that is a real privilege. Uh, and that's more important than being part of a discipline. It's being able to explore outside your discipline if you have to, and go places that other people don't go. I think so. Anyway. Where do you want to go now? <laughs> well, uh, in a few things, maybe you can tell us. I come back because you said many things which are very interesting to uh, uh, explore further, if you, uh, you agree. But uh, if we move back to uh, time or this present you refer to, how did you uh, became interested in two anthropology? How that idea yeah. came. I was never really interested in anthropology. I was interested in the Australian Aborigines. And that happened, um, say my parents came over after the war from England, settled first in southern Ontario for just for a few months and then came here to Perth. And my father ran the newspaper here. So I was brought up here and uh, went to high school. Wasn't very good in school at all. It was I failed grade 13 when we had grade 13. Spent two years in grade 13, and my dad was going to haul me out and put me in the back shop of the Perth Courier. And one of the guidance counselors told him not to, to, to leave me in school. And then they passed the rule in school that you couldn't play football and basketball unless you got your grades up the previous term. And that was an incentive for me to work hard and get my grades up. So there's no way I wasn't going to play basketball after Christmas. So I got my grades up. I got 64% at the end of the year, and I got into Carlton. University, and that's how I got there. But I was, and I was, you know, I played baseball. I, I really like sports. That's why, if I had a choice back then, I would have been a, a pro ball player, baseball player. And I went down to the States, had some experience down there. But, you know, I couldn't hit a curveball, so it didn't work out. <laughs> so I went to Carleton, and then uh, Carleton, like I sort of learned how to write 
essays and how to write exams. Half of it's what the professor expects you to to learn, so you have to be disciplined, right? And so I got, so I kind of I got into first year Carlton. I got D's and C's. And my second year was uh, C's and B's. Third year was B's and A's, and the fourth year was straight A's. So I figured it out. And then I, my father wanted me to go to law school and then come back here and maybe go into politics, become a lawyer, come back to Perth. <clears throat> so I spent uh, two weeks at Queen's Law School, took one look at the case book and said, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm not going to do this. And then one of my profs at Carleton, uh, he recommended me to the University of Alberta for a, a master's degree in sociology. So I went out there and I didn't really like it. It was very quantitative. The department was almost entirely American and the Americans were brought up to get the grants for student grants and the Canadian kids were left, you know, having to work and it's a typical story back then. And so uh, I quit and got interested in making films because I've always thought I think more visually than verbally sometimes. Like, I just like visual things, as you can see. <laughs> and so I went to the National Film Board in Winnipeg and s to see if it was possible to study there or do something there. And they sent me off to England to the London School of Film Technique in Covent Garden, which eventually joined with the National Film School. So while I was there, I ran into... Um, a student from the University of Alberta who was doing his PhD in philosophy at the University of London. And I, was ma I got married in 1967, uh, so my wife and I were there in London. And so we went to this party, I got a grad student party. So I went to this party and everybody was talking about this French anthropologist named Claude Lévi-Strauss and a new wave of theoretical things called structuralism. So everybody's saying, you've got to read this guy, you know. He's just being translated into English by Rodney Needham for the most part. So I went out and I picked up uh, a couple of books and uh, reading about different logics and different cultures. I came across the Australian Aborigines, who Levi-Strauss thought were one of the most difficult people on earth to understand. And so I thought, oh, this is interesting, right? So I went out to the Australia High Commission and I got a couple of books from the library on the Aborigines and read them. And they didn't make any sense to me at all. Like, it, 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 they're supposed to be understandable, but they didn't make sense. There was something about them that didn't make sense and yet it was appealing, right? There was something about it. One of those things like, if these are the experts and they haven't got it right, Maybe I should try and get it right myself. And that's what I did. So my wife and I went to the Australian High Commission and applied for assisted passage migrants. And we went out to Australia for 10 pounds, a three-week cruise via South Africa to Perth in West Australia. And before that, I'd gone to the University of London to see if they could take me in and it was during the devaluation of the British pound, a serious devaluation. And Phyllis Cabry was the chair, and she had worked with Aboriginal women in Australia, and she said they could take me in as a student, but couldn't fund me to go to Australia. So she would write to these people in Perth, in West Australia, Ronald and Catherine Burnt, and say, you know, I could apply there. So that's what happened. And they wrote back and said, uh, if I could get myself out there, I could go into the master's preliminary because didn't have a master's degree. I just had my BA, master's preliminary program, and then go from there. 